Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to the School of Personal Finance. Today's video, we're gonna be talking about renting versus buying a home. So this housing market just been going up for the last few years at a ridiculous pace. I've talked to so many people who are wondering, you know, should I wait for a pullback before purchasing a home? Does it make sense to maybe rent for a few years and then see what happens? Is buying a home a good investment? Is it something that I need to do like right away or am I gonna get priced out forever? So in this video, I'm gonna give my thoughts on this. I'm gonna share my journey of home ownership through the years. I'm gonna explain a little bit if it really is an investment and how you should kind of calculate that and make a determination, but also just the pros and cons in general of home ownership compared to rentals and my thoughts, my feelings about it. I hope that you find this one helpful today. All right, let's get to it. All right, so two quick things before I get started. The first one is I have this terrible summer cold right now, so apologies for my raspy voice. And the second thing is I would love it if you'd head over to schoolofpersonalfinance.com and join my email list. So I'm in the process of creating you know, this whole financial education platform with the School of Personal Finance, and the best way for me to push it out to people and to inform you about it would be through email. Now, if you Google renting versus buying a home, you get so many different opinions out there, and they could be from financial planners, they could be from the media, from CNBC, just everybody has their own opinion on if it's a good investment versus a bad investment. I mean, there's been a movement of renters, right, with the younger ages where they just like the flexibility of renting and they're not looking to purchase homes, even though that seems to have been shifting over the last couple of years. Now, if you watch my content, you know that I invest in real estate, that I love real estate as an asset. But when you're talking about your primary home that you're going to live in, that's a different ball game. Like if we're talking about a rental property, then yes, it's all about the numbers and the market and the location and, you know, how many renters are in the area and what your return on investment could be. But when you're talking about the place that you and your family are going to live in, that is an emotional decision. That is a family decision. That you can't just look at the numbers and say, is it better to buy or rent? There's so many different things that go into that. With that said, I do believe, and I always have, that owning a home over a long period of time is a great way to build wealth, as long as you do it the right way. And these last few years, I mean, it's just reinforced that with the prices of homes going up so much. But when I think about this decision, the first thing, I need to take a step back and not even think about numbers. All I'm thinking about is my family and my current stage in life, right? So if I'm single and I really don't know where I'm going to end up in life, I don't know, you know, if I'm going to get married, when I'm going to get married, where I might might want to change jobs and move to a different location, then obviously renting is very appealing, especially if you want to travel, if you want the flexibility, all of those pros that come with renting a house where you're not tied down to anything, then renting makes a ton of sense. If you feel like you're missing out on the real estate boom that's going on, then I would encourage you to look to invest in real estate in places where the numbers make sense and where you could get a great rate of return on your investment. But you can't think of it like I need to buy a home that I'm going to live in so that I don't miss out on this housing market, you know, that I'm wasting money on rent. Like, I think that's such a BS thing to hear people say is that renting is a waste of money because no matter how you slice it, you have a housing cost. So if you're renting or if you're buying a house, either way, there is a cost associated with living in that house. So I don't think that you should be basing the decision just on an investment standpoint. If you want to do that, then go buy rental properties. That is the best way to go. The other part of that is your current financial situation. So do you have a big enough down payment. The worst thing in the world to do is to start out in life and put yourself in a very tight situation just to get yourself to purchase a home where the monthly payments are tight. Like, believe me, you could, the mortgage lenders, they will give you much more of a mortgage than you really need. So you can't go by what they tell you that you could afford to pay every month. You have to figure that stuff out yourself. And the worst thing you could do is put that pressure on yourself right out of the gate. You want to give yourself a lot of wiggle room. You want to have 20% that you could put as a down payment on this home. So you go in with tight finances. You can't have a ton of credit card debt and bad debt, student loan debt, all of this debt that you have to pay every single month. And then you throw, you know, this mortgage obligation on top of it, where if you do have a big maintenance item, if something unexpected comes up, you know, you can really throw your finances into a terrible situation. So there's no need to rush and to press into buying a home right out of the gate. So that first step of what I always call turning the lights on, knowing exactly where your money goes every month, what your bills are, how much you have coming in, how much you have going out, what your buffer is you want to be very aware of that and run all the numbers before you even think about making a big commitment to buying a house. 
And for the down payment, you know, if you could save 20% for a down payment, then that shows that you have done well financially, that you've been able to diligently save that money and that you're ready to go purchase a home. So I'm a big fan of having that 20% down payment as opposed to doing these 5%, 3.5%, even 10% down payments where you then have to pay PMI as well. Now, going back to the stage of life you're in, like if you're married, so I'm 43 years old, right? I'm married, I have three kids. So in my stage of life, I would much rather be a homeowner, right? So I've built roots in this community. My kids go to the schools here, right? I've been here for many years. The last thing that I would want is to have a landlord send me a notice saying that he's not going to renew my lease because he's gonna sell the property and I have to go find another place to live. Also, I wanna be able to put you know, a basketball hoop in my driveway or a swing set out in the backyard. So you wanna be able to customize your home and when you have a family, you know that stability, that security of just knowing that you have a place to call your own and it's there for as long as you want to live there, that to me is priceless, right? That's the pride of home ownership where you put your stake in your ground and you say, you know, this is where I'm gonna raise my family and this is where we are. So that's a very different stage of life. If maybe you're in between those stages, maybe you don't have a family, but you're not right out of college, maybe you're getting married, maybe you're in your late 20s, your early 30s, and you wanna go ahead and purchase a home, then it really does come down to what kind of financial footing are you on? Do you have stable finances? Do you have stable jobs? Do you have enough for that down payment? And then the length of time. Do you plan on staying in the house for a very long period of time? Because the transaction costs, if you move every couple of years, it makes the cost of home ownership very expensive where it negates a lot of the pros of being a homeowner. Now, in many places, the cost of renting is typically a little bit more than the cost of the mortgage payment if you were to own the home, right? With the mortgage payment, if you were the buyer, obviously you would have needed that down payment. So that's gonna make a difference how much of a down payment you put down to see what that mortgage payment would be. But typically, that's the way that it's gonna be. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because if the rent payments are, say, on a $1,500 rent, Right To own that home, maybe it would be $1,200 for the mortgage and the property taxes and insurance. And you need to have that gap there because if it was the same, then investors like me, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't want that house, right? Because if I bought a house as an investment property and I was going to rent it and I could rent it for $1,200 a month and the mortgage payment, the cost of me owning that house was also $1,200 a month, then there's no delta there. I'm not making any money by having that rental property. So I wouldn't buy that property, right? So the rents are usually going to be a little bit more. If that's not the case, then what's gonna happen is there's not gonna be that much demand for that house and the price will go down until we get to that point where there is a difference in the rent. Now, obviously, it's not like that in every market. There are some outliers like New York City or San Francisco where, you know, the prices to own a home or an apartment there are just, you know, ridiculous. So there are going to be outliers. And even in points in time, there might be outliers as well. But for the most part, you could always expect to pay a little bit more on the rent side than on the mortgage side if you were to own that property. Now, when you hear financial advisors or people in the media saying that it's a terrible investment, what they're basically saying is that what you should do is instead of investing that down payment into the, into the property and all the maintenance costs and the expenses that come with home ownership, if instead, if you take that money and you invest it in an S&P 500 fund, which over the long term has returned 8% a year, then you're much better off. You will have much more money by renting and investing the difference. But for me, I disagree with that completely. So the first thing is people don't automatically save any excess money. You have to be very disciplined in order to do that. And by owning a home and having a mortgage, it is for savings, right? You're always gonna make your mortgage payment before anything else. So it forces you to pay that mortgage payment every month and you build equity in the house. So it is for savings. And now whenever these financial advisors, they calculate the rate of return, what they're doing is they're saying, well, the S&P 500 does 8%, home appreciation over the last 40 years. I mean, all markets are different, so you can't even make a general assumption. But if we do, we could say home prices go up typically around 4% a year. So there's a difference there of 4% that you could make by just investing in the S&P 500. But that is wrong on many levels. And the biggest reason is because when you purchase a home, you use leverage, you use the bank's money. So if you put 20% down, that means that the bank is putting 80% down. So just use simple numbers. All right, if you buy a house for $400,000, you have $80,000 into that home. If that home over the next two years, say it goes up 10%, right? It would go from 400,000 up to 440,000. So you made $40,000 in equity right there, and you've only put $80,000 into the house. So that's a 50% return just on the 10% rise 
in the value of the home. Now, there are other factors, you know, you might be screaming at me, oh, well, you have, you know, closing costs and you have 5% realtor fee if you try to sell out of that property. And all those things are true. But over the long term, you could see where I'm going here, right? The leverage helps tremendously. And who's to say that home prices are going to go up forever? I mean, it's just not, not the case, as we all remember, in 2008, 2009. But over the long term, houses have been pretty damn stable. If you look at a very long term chart of housing markets, right? Three and a half percent, four percent steady appreciation has been pretty predictable. It's not a volatile asset at all compared to the S&P 500 or the stock market or individual stocks. And now leverage is obviously a double-edged sword. So if the home prices go down in value, then you could have your equity wiped out pretty quickly. And this is where things could get very ugly, right? Because what if it drops more than that? What if you're now underwater and you owe more on the house than what it's actually worth? And then you want to move then you can't move. What happens if you lose your job? What happens if you can't afford the payments? Now you're really screwed. And this is what we saw happen during the Great Recession you know, of 2008, 2009. So there's a lot of risk with owning your own home. And there's a lot of things that come along with that. So I'm not saying that home ownership is right for everybody, but I am saying that it is a way to build long-term wealth with forced savings and just letting the market dynamics take place over a long period of time and using leverage. So I am a fan of having mortgages. I don't think it's a great idea to pay cash for homes, especially rental properties, but that's a different discussion. But with interest rates so low and being able to lock in a 30-year fixed rate mortgage payment, I think it is a great idea to take out that 80% mortgage and pay it over the 30 years and then invest the difference. So you make your mortgage payment. If you still have extra money left over, you can invest that difference in different assets, build up your cash savings. And that's a nice overall diversified you know, portfolio where you have many different things working for you. And you've heard me talk about this before, but with inflation, with the expectations of it being higher in the future, if we look out 10 or 15 years from now, that mortgage payment might seem very small compared to what it feels like today, just because the dollar keeps getting you know, eroded down. And think about it. If you had a mortgage payment from 25 years ago or 20 years ago, it would feel like nothing compared to what the mortgage payments are today. So locking it in for that long-term, low-rate, fixed-interest debt, I think it is a great way to own a home. But again, I feel much more comfortable, especially in these elevated prices of putting 20% down. And another thing that I just don't hear people talk about often enough is the increase in the cost of rent through the years. So again, you have to look at this with a long-term time horizon. If you look 15 years out, there's a very good chance that your rent could double over those 15 years. But now, if you had a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, 15 years later, your housing payment, your mortgage payment is fixed. It hasn't changed at all. Like, yes, your property taxes might have gone up, your insurance costs might have gone up, but it's nowhere near compared to a double in your housing payment, right? So by locking that in, not only, you can't only look at today's numbers, you gotta look at in the future, you'll be much better off in the future. So when you run the numbers on, does it make sense to rent, ver to rent a home versus buying a home? You're only looking at today. You're looking at what's my payment today versus you know my mortgage payment versus my rent payment. You're not saying 15 years from now, now, what will my mortgage payment be versus what will my rent payment be at that point? And it's just going to always go in your favor if you're a homeowner, right? Your mortgage payment is going to be fixed. Rents aren't going down. So it's never going to be less than what it is today. Those rent payments, they're going to go up. Yes, maybe they've gotten ahead of themselves and there could be a little short-term, you know, evening out or blip on the increase in rents, but they're going up over the next 20 years. There's no doubt about that. And not even to mention the tax benefits. So your primary residence, you get an exclusion for gains in the gain of the property over the years. So if you're married filing jointly right now, you could exclude up to $500,000 in gains in your primary residence where you don't have to pay taxes on it. And if you're single, it's half of that, it's 250,000. So even when you compare that to investing the difference into the stock market, there's a big tax benefit to owning your own home as well. I think home ownership is a great thing. I think it's a great way to build equity, to build wealth, and it could be part of an overall retirement plan when you get older and you decide to downsize, you have this tax-free money that you're able to pull out, and then maybe you buy something much smaller that you could pay cash for, and now you have no mortgage payment, you got some money left over, you got social security, Hopefully you're you know, investing in 401ks and IRAs and all these pieces together make up your overall retirement plan. So I am a big fan of home ownership if that hasn't come across already. I do think that it's a good investment. I'll even use that word even though you shouldn't look at it like an investment. I'm also a fan of investing in real estate outside of your primary home and I think you look at those completely different than you look at your primary home. But overall, I'm not against home ownership unless you go into it, you know, 
all the bad ways that I described earlier with not enough money in the bank, with a high debt to income ratio, putting three and a half percent down, hoping that the market's going to continue going higher and then getting, you know, smacked in the face and having this big burden on your back that it stresses the crap out of you. I hope that you found this one helpful. I tried not to just throw out the pros and cons of renting versus buying that you hear in every other video and try to give you my own perspective and a little bit of my own, you know, experience with everything through the years. Please make sure to subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed already. Go check out School of Personal Finance and I'll see you again in the next video. Thanks.